Fright Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer and fictionist, if you watched the <laughs> last episode. I'm going to claim that title. Okay. Um, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, and I will be talking at the St. Louis um, Library Central Branch on the 26th. Come down, we're going to be talking about story structure. And with me today is... Kathleen Kayembe. I write uh, paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. I run writing groups for people here in St. Louis, um, although that is just starting, so be nice to me, y'all. Mm-hmm. And um, I have stories forthcoming from Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines. Excellent. And also with us today is... Uh, Brian R. Cook, the author of The Iron Chronicles... And uh, a bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Iron Chronicles is Iron Horseman, Iron Zulu, and soon to be Iron Lotus, the third, the final, in the trilogy. Right. Uh, yes, thank you. Do check it out. Uh, drops um, November 22nd, but join me on November 26th, that's Saturday, uh, at Main Street Books in St. Charles. We're going to be doing a big launch party. It is Small Business Saturday, so come out and support a great local bookstore. It's also the kickoff of Christmas traditions, so all of Main Street will be transported back to the 1800s, and we're going to steampunk it out. And also? I'm Melanie Lucas, uh, author of, well, technically science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. <laughs> Fedora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and my new book, Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and I am... Vice President of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Woo-hoo. My name is Jennifer Solzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. You can find uh, my picture books, my picture book, uh, Dog Park on Amazon under Jennifer Stolzer. You can hopefully find my um, fantasy novel for young adults and adults, Threadcaster, uh, next to spring. I'm aiming for spring now. This is my goal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see more of my artwork at jennifersolzer.com. You can also check out some of her kick-ass illustrations at Alexander Sketchbook. On hey, there you go. There you Contact go. me if you need some uh, some concept art and are willing to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and today we're going to talk about um, using animals and the rules of using animals in our fiction, be it regular fiction, and I, when I say regular fiction, I'm talking about mysteries, Historical, et cetera, upset in the real world, or science fiction and fantasy. What about children's? And yeah. children, well, children, children's can fall. This falls into both of those. Categories. How about in all writing? In all writing, fine. <laughs> I'm all inclusive in my writing on the animals. He's okay. like, gosh, fine. Well, I want to say that animals, as characters and as useful things in all kinds of writing, is a time-honored tradition which goes back all the way past the common era to about 2,500 years ago, we still have examples of fables written by Aesop. Yep. And many of those, of course, are about animals and especially they have a place today because not only do we still use them, expressions have come from Aesop's fables, like a dog in the manger. Do you know what a dog in the manger is all about? No. no. Okay. Well, <laughs> may I tell you? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the Aesop's fable that that is all about is about an ox and a barn and a manger, which is where the ox's food is hay. But a dog comes up and makes his bed in the hay which wouldn't have bothered the ox so much, except when he came in to get his food, the dog 
barked at him and snapped at him and bit at him and wouldn't let him eat. So the moral of the story, of course, is that it is truly an evil person or animal that will keep something for himself that he cannot even use from someone who could. So, and another is Bell the Cat, but I'll let somebody else talk first. Give me some more Aesop, though. I love Aesop. Yes. I would like to uh, bring into this discussion a distinction that I think is important to make. You have animals as characters with kind of human points of view or human... Uh, Humanistic aspects. Yeah, yeah so... Animals? Yes, anthropomorphized yeah, animals. Yes, anthropomorphized animals. So... so just uh, Animal Farm, perfect example of that. <laughs> All those characters are animals, mm -hmm. but they think like humans. Mm -hmm. And they communicate to us, like to the reader, as human characters who you can see the perspective of. Mm -hmm. Charlotte's Web. Mm -hmm. Charlotte's Web. That's one of the nicer, softer side, but yeah. Um, Still and about dying. Yeah, yes. I was going to say, it's <laughs> nice and softer. So we have animals that okay. are anthropomorphized, and we also have animals that appear as animals. So mm -hmm. in I Am Legend... Uh, the film, the dog, does not, you know, think and communicate as a, as a human character does. But the dog is still, you know, a character. It's just not speaking. It's acting as a dog. Um, and in other movies and other stories, like, yes. the well, animals are just animals. It is a bird. To go with David's softer side, Old Yeller. Yeah, uh, where the dog is a yeah. dog. Also about death. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah totally do, joking. Do where the red fern grows. I hear that. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. All the. Uh, we'll, we'll get to what you can do to an animal soon. Yeah, but that, I would that like that it noted <laughs> to how animals can be used. In the story. And I would like it noted that all of these stories, the animals were dogs. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's red pony. Uh, and for children. Well, the there's always the cat black series, series, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I was actually going to throw out that I love um, animals as characters. Um, in the Iron Chronicles, you have Rodan, who is my dragon. Um, in Iron Lotus, you will have uh, Kolai, who is uh, an owl. And uh, I, I love having animals as characters. Now, I, I do a mix of the two. You don't actually ever hear Rodan speak because he doesn't have the ability to speak. Mm -hmm. But I give him human characteristics, so he's an animal, you know, per se. He's not like necessarily. Does he have a human intelligence? Yes. Does he have a human emotional uh, range and yes. perception? But so does my cat. <laughs> so, you know, I treat him very much like an animal. He, you know, with animalistic kind of emotions and stuff like that. But then. Um, as you'll learn in Iron Lotus, there's a bit of a uh, an uptick from that, where you know he has some actual sense and thought and can mm -hmm. possibly understand English. Um, so, I just love using animals as characters. I think it's a great way of one. It's cute. It's adorable. Instantly, it makes every scene cute, funny. You know, they're great characters for that. Yeah, like in um, Tremors. Tremors <laughs> <laughs> is a beloved classic. Wow. Full of sweet, cute animals. I will yeah. go to bat for the ass blasters. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I just want to say that animals don't always have to be sweet and cute and nice. No, no, they don't. No, but it's it's a way of using them. Mm, okay. Because you can have horrible animals too. I think uh, going back to Kathleen's example of an animal farm. What Orwell was trying to do was to uh, put Stalin in his place at yes. the end of World War II. Hmm. But that's not the kind of thing you could readily do in England at the time because, after all, Russia was our fair-haired boy. The Germans ran smack into a block of ice when they went down to Russia. Right. And so Russia was our ally at the time. But Orwell wanted to show the difficulty which we see over and over again time after time revolution which succeeds then breeds its own seeds of counter-revolution mm -hmm. or at least power that corrupts absolutely so that Napoleon becomes even worse Napoleon's a pig he becomes <laughs> even worse than Mr. Jones. By the way, that's a literal pig, not a metaphorical pig. <laughs> yes, yeah, literal. I mean, no, no statements being made about actual Napoleon Bonaparte at this time. <laughs> Who jailed Alexander Damas' dad because he was the real-life Count of Monte Cristo? Let's just point that out. Yes. Go on. 
Okay, that's <laughs> if you <know>. can. <laughs> anyway, the black count. Fundle. And so we see over and over again that that is exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. When people rise up in a revolution, that what they get is not what they want. It may look like it's what they want for a little while, but then power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and so you get a system that's even worse than, than the one they rebelled against. And he could do this with animals because it was hidden. It could be read simply as a story if you wanted to, and not as any kind of political dissertation at all, though I think most people would say that's clearly what it is. Oh, I was just going to bring up that uh, if you listen to our last episode about interpreting the world through story, um, what Fedora has brought up with Animal Farm is a great uh, way that people use sci-fi and fantasy often to, to show a different world or an interpretation of our world, but in... That's less threatening. Yes. Less threatening to the reader. Mm -hmm. yes. Which is a good segue into what I want to talk about, which is about animals in children's literature. I draw a lot of animals in my career as a children's illustrator. Dog Park. Dog Park is my own. Dog Park is, uh, is a more realistic take on animals. Like, the dogs actually bark and run around. and uh, They have thoughts and they have feelings because they are my characters, but I draw a lot of anthropomorphic animals. Animals that are wearing clothes and walking on their hind legs and the latter half of Animal Farm. <laughs> but um, uh, animals are very popular for kids, for young, very young kids as characters, uh, because animals in general are considered innocent things. And a little kid who is a, a limited uh, processing power of the world around them, their experiences are much smaller. Uh, and they see, you know, experiences feel very dramatic to little kids because they haven't had a whole lot of them to compare to. Uh, animals are a nice, uh, a fun way to approach in a way that isn't threatening, like, like we just said. It's, uh, it also uh, lets you sort of project yourself as a little kid into situations easily while you're still forming your own identity. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you like elephants. Elephants are fun. You have a stuffed element that you, that's your favorite uh, uh, stuffed animal, so therefore, you really like the elephant character in the zoo story, and or Babar, or Babar which was <laughs> me telling my life story because I loved Babar so very much, and I still do very much. But uh, the the reason that animals are so popular for little kids is all those things that I just said, and also because of uh, a, a sense of sort of blurring of realistic lines. You know, you're they're all the animals are all living together. If it's all about dogs, they're all dogs. They could be different kinds of dogs. They could be uh, dogs of different ages and shapes. Perhaps it's a zoo and it's all the different animals of all over the place and they all live together. No one's asking any questions about race or socioeconomic class or, or any sort of uh, complex approach in that way. So it's from a marketing standpoint, from a creator standpoint, I can make a. I've made a, a picture book that is yet to be published about a caribou, and I could put that caribou book into the hands of any child because that caribou is not telling them who they need to think who they are. You know, it's like it, the difference would be uh, all those times you hear of parents not you know giving the princess book to the little girl and saying this is a girl book, and then giving the firefighter book to the boy and saying this is a boy book. Like, you're gendering out, you're making a rule. But if you say, this is a dog book, you can give it to both kids because you aren't making any rules about dogs. Or you can. You know, people write all sorts of stories about dogs wearing tutus that are girl dogs with ballerinas, and they give them to girls because they think those are the only people who can enjoy those kind of things. But that's a different topic. And you're totally hitting on something. This, this is huge in children's literature. Um, you know, you can, you can look at the Berenstein Bears, mm -hmm. which... You know, by being bears, it's a gen it's a raceless family. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone can adapt, and you know. Although by identify. being Berenstains. Good point. It's yes. implied to be Jewish, <laughs> <laughs> but they're also brown. Yes. So. Exactly. So, but you know, it's it's a way of telling stories. Um, you've got some of the wonderful uh, uh, Seuss books, and I'm thinking of like Go Dog Go. And Which was written by Dr. Seuss. Oh yeah, that's right. That's not Seuss. You're thinking Green Eggs and Ham. Yeah. That well, no, 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 I'm thinking of. I was thinking of Go Dogs Go, but I was had the wrong people. 
And then I can't think of them who does them, but they're like all the like the millions of animals that are like dressed in suits and they're running around in little cities and they do different. Oh, Richard Scary. Yeah. The Busy World. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those. I mean, what kid doesn't start off with those books? I had a placemat. It you taught know. me cars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, by doing this, it's a way of showing the world, showing diversity. It's you know. By having different animals, you can have different settings and all this kind of stuff. It allows you to show all of this. You know, I'm thinking Curious George, Mm. where you have a monkey. He gets in trouble. Gets in trouble and runs around and does everything like that. And, you know, is constantly running around with the man with the yellow hat, which we won't talk about what that relationship is trying to show. His adopted father, thank you very much. (laughs) Is that that kind of connected to what uh, Pixar does in the Cars film, where because it's not people, it's not representative representative of race necessarily mm-hmm. okay yeah, but it is about racing <laughs> it deals with race but not the kind of races think. but not races and zootopia does the same thing Zootop- actually but zootopia yeah. uses it to address that specifically yes. now i will say some go ahead no that's right no go ahead, go ahead. I want to do something else. Well, <laughs> She's like please hurry up and get to me i was saying that animals one thing that i've noticed that comes up and in some ways, it kind of reinforces things, too. Um, I've noticed this in Star Trek Aliens, too. But um, <laughs> in some ways, it doesn't deal with race. And in other ways, the, the bear always ends up with the bear. The bunny always ends up with the bunny. You know, the girl is always, you know, you know, the cute little rabbit is always going to end up with, you know, they're, he's going to ask the other rabbit to the dance. Which is why we now have Zootopia, which has flipped yeah. that model on set. Mm-hmm. And which is why there are shifter romances where a bunny and a rattlesnake shifter <laughs> will get together and fall uh, in love. Can we eventually yeah, talk about dinosaur mind. porn? Okay. <laughs> dinosaur yeah, I think I want to talk now. Fedora. <laughs> Well, I think you're all just ignoring 2,000 years of history here. Look at the fairy tales, which often use animals, and they do not make cute little animals that are non-racist. They are often vicious animals, like the wolf that uh, threatened Little Red Riding Hood and ate her grandma. Come on. And it was, of course, to get kids to stay in line, to not venture out into the woods, and not put themselves in danger. And I think that's a very legitimate use, and it's very far from what we've got now. We're talking Just about children's things. stories. Yeah, animals. yes, those are children's those fairy tales. Are, are a children's class stories of their too. own? To me. <laughs> but um, they're children's stories, and that's what you want well, to talk, talk about. Let's talk about the Little Mermaid yeah. or something like that. The horrible way that ends. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with that man. <laughs> I was discussing mm-hmm. my industry and why we <laughs> use animals. Yes. Thank you. Ignoring yes. is not what was going on. Exactly no, because I'm animals totally are used. fairy tales. Because fairy tales. Mm-hmm. Are a wonderful way. I mean, we have, you know, like Anansi the Spider is, I mean, the, that whole series of yeah, stories is well, amazing. Well, we're all talking about anthropomorphizing animals, and you're, are, there are... In children's literature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fairy tales is a different kind of children's literature, and there are other stories that include wolves, like Dracula. Those wolves are scary. Yeah. Friggin' scary. They're not cute and cuddly. So it's a different kind of use of the same kind of creature, but those aren't anthropomorphized either. Well, and as we were talking about fairy tales, fairy tales is a way of imparting a message. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was aimed at children, but it was also aimed at, you know, adults, adults too. Adults fairy tales, yeah. too. I mean, there's a way well, of... That, was, that This is us talking about uh, a verbal uh, storytelling culture. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, they were telling stories that were easy to remember, that were easy to retell, uh, to educate everybody. Storyteller mm-hmm. and the audiences that they didn't tell it to and have it passed on so yes. that people know not to go by themselves into the woods or to venture off the path or eat random apples. <laughs> well, animals appear. I'm going to take us on another route uh, because we're really focused All on All right, Lassie, where are we going now? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to hear your pants? Um, never do that to the voice actor. Anyway, I'm going to change the change direction a little bit, a little more, and um, playing with the animals in fiction stories that are more aimed at trying to make them real or real world. There was used to be a series of mysteries called The Cat Who. The Cat Who Sniffed Glue. The Cat Who Talked to Cardinals. The Cat Who the cat who Saw Ghosts. It's a very eccentric cat. It was a very eccentric cat. It was a story about a man who had crime fall in his lap and his two cats, um, who were Siamese, that were Yum Yum and Coco. Do I remember the names? Yes. Right? 
And Coco was the hero <laughs> of the story. Yeah, and Coco was the one who was trying to solve the crime, but he didn't talk. But he tried to give hints to the human. And like for example, and it was always left open whether or not Coco was actually yeah. doing this on purpose right. or not. For example, um, in the story of the cat, um, spoiler alert, the cat who sniffed glue, um, it was, it was a, a, a twin, <laughs> murdered his own brother, and used, sta used stage glue on a mustache to make himself look like his brother, so he was trying to pass himself off, and the cat would always go to old books and be look like he's trying to sniff the glue of the old books as a hint to, hey, glue's being involved here, Just, you need to pay attention. Um, another one, and I, right now I can't think of the act, the author of the story, so I found the story completely humorous. It's a private eye investigation, investigation story, told through the private eye's dog, through the eyes of a dog, and the dog while it's talking is acting like a dog, and it's fun to read. It's a whole different take on the private eye. I read a romance that was like that. Um, it was a gay romance story told from the point of view of a female dog who was pregnant mm -hmm. who was taken in by one of the people that was going to be involved in this romance. And it was great because she was scratching herself and she was like raising her kids and she was like, I don't understand why the two legs are doing these things. They smell weird. Like, it was great. It was, yeah. it was how I would imagine a dog to think about humans. But it was still telling a story, a larger story, that the dog didn't entirely understand, but that you, the reader, did. I thought it was a great use of animal point of view while still retaining the animal qualities. Reminds me of 101 Dalmatians. Yeah. That's long ago in Padita, meet, you know, and basically hook up their people. Yeah. Get part of that. Disney actually does a lot with, the, with animals. They're kind of obsessed with animals. I mean, not only do they do their movies where you have, like, the Aristocats where... You know, all the cats are running around playing instruments and everything like that. You have... Lady uh, in the Tramp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lady in the Tramp, where our 101 Dalmatians, where they're more acting like dogs and, you know, everything like that. They keep it up now. You've got the Lion King, you know, where everything is, you know, acting the way it should, but then it's all about a king, you know, setting... It's the story of Hamlet. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Disney's kind of huge. And then Disney has their whole live-action division that keeps... Here, I, I should say, for any of us who are children of the 80s and 70s, uh, Disney was kind of obsessed with animals back then. I mean, you know, yep. not just Disney, but Hollywood in general. And Those like, Rangers. Yeah. Well, you had Benji oh. and all that kind of weird live action yeah. stuff. Was Lassie the 50s? Yeah. When was Mr. Ed? Same. Same. Hollywood's always been kind of obsessed with animals. But I was particularly thinking of like Benji and Homeward Bound. That's because <gasps> oh, <that's 'cause laughs> animals get oh, away with a lot more than humans can. Because humans come with a lot of uh, baggage, baggage mm -hmm. to them. So you could tell a story about uh, Benji the dog and how he uh, raises... What, what is the, the baby animals he ends up adopting in that one story? I don't even remember. Which Benji? There's yeah, 37 of them. That's true. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, we don't have to ask, who is Benji, where did he come from, what agenda is he pushing? He's a dog. Now, right. Mr. Ed, there was a bit of backstory, Mi there was Mr. a bit of baggage there. Mr. Ed, though, is a horse. <laughs> yes. A talking horse. He's a talking horse. Can we go from there, then, into certain genre tropes that have to do with animals? Because I know you guys have brought up mysteries and you can't kill a cat. Yeah, you're not allowed to kill cats or dogs unless, unless it's, you're talking about It's a, cheap to kill right. the cat and the dog. Right. It's a shortcut to uh, emotional manipulation of your audience. And, and it's likely to get you yelled at by your audience. So. Yeah, it's like we're getting we're we're tired of seeing the animal get killed and everything because we've gotten to the point where it's expected and it's seen as a cheap shot. Yeah, speaking of speaking of the eighties there was a time during the 80s whenever you saw a dog in a certain genre of TV shows, like that dog was going to die by the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. Stephen King would do that in books of his that I've read to show that a character was evil. They would kill a dog. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's shorthand. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. absolutely shorthand. Horrifying. I still can't so get out it's one It's not of those so much a rule that you can't do it, it's that we advise you not to do it because you're a better writer than that. No, it, it's it, not only that, but in mysteries, people like read about mysteries 
for fun because they want to enjoy it, and most mystery readers don't enjoy reading about dismembered animals for some reason. They'd rather read, they're expecting to read about dismembered humans, but not dismembered fluffy. That's Which because actually, animals are considered innocent, as yeah, yeah, stated yeah. before. I was like, he didn't do anything to deserve that. If the human did, it's like, oh, well. Yeah, but you'd you know. be better off doing, like, kids you have to be careful of, but... Uh, I was going to say that's interesting because in, in a certain type of mystery, it's about a serial killer killing human after human, and a lot of that's serial killers type. begin by killing mm -hmm. animals. Yes. Yeah. Don't kill John Wick's dog. No. Oh, <laughs> my heart. I know. It's horrible. That was Go the ahead, worst. But well, says that the whole rest of that book. It does. The opposite of that is true also that uh, there is a wonderful book which every writer ought to read called Save the Cat, and I can't yeah. remember the author at the moment, but it is a good way to show, the treatment of animals that is, it's a good way to show that your character is good or has redeeming qualities or something to balance out bad things that they have done so that uh, it is a very telling thing that writers can use to be kind to animals mm -hmm. or have a character be kind to animals. That is interesting shorthand. Um, as Jen was saying, because animals are innocent and people kind of say the same thing about kids in, in writing and in film and TV. Like, if you're mean to, to animals or to kids, or, you know, just short with them, that says bad things about your character versus, like, if you're nice and you stop to help, you know, the dog in the road or something, you're clearly a good it's person. because the animal and the kid depend on the adults to mm -hmm. look after them. Can I have a, a reference? Save the Cat, the last book on screenwriting you'll ever need by Blake uh, Snyder. Blake Snyder, right? Yeah. Also, too, you can use animals to show a different, softer side of your villain. Let me toss out one that we've all seen, and we've seen it used in its parodies as well. James Bond, Spectre. Usually the, bat, the head of Spectre has what? The cat. Fluffy cat. It's White, a cat. fluffy cat. You know how I know that? The parody you were just going to mention. <laughs> uh-huh. Dr. <laughs> Evil. Dr. Evil and... Mr. Bigglesworth. Or Is perhaps Bigglesworth? from... Uh, uh, Inspector Gadget. Yes. yes. Oh, right. He had Dr. that too. But take, but take a look at the. Let's, let me. I'm going to stick with James Bond here for a moment. But take a the head of an organization that's supposed to be secret, who wants, who is behind um, revenge and extortion and so forth. And what's his? What does he like to do? He likes to pet his cat. The whole looking at it. Supposed to be Mr. Evil, but yeah, how can he be completely evil? Of course, it is a cat, which I do love my cats, but still. <laughs> well, cats are very special and always have been. They were worshipped in ancient Egypt. And they still remember. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way they behave, at least the three that are around here do. Yes. <laughs> but ever since, they have always had mystical qualities, perhaps because they are kind of unpredictable and uh, go their own way and do what they want mm -hmm. and so they're often associated with uh, sorcery and witchcraft familiars of witches and are enigmatic creatures they can come in any size from tiny little cute kittens to very big ugly tigers and lions that can certainly kill you without any kind of remorse at all. Mm -hmm. So we're very enchanted, I think, with the feline kingdom, and we give them many powers that they may or may not have, too. Yeah, to, uh, to you know, tag on to that, the three most used animals are cats, dogs, and horses, mm -hmm. which are also the three that we have specifically spent thousands of years, you know, kind of bringing into us. Uh, dogs, you know, are have been our companions for many thousands of years. Probably one of the oldest animals that we have been, had companionship mm -hmm. with. Um, cats actually a little bit less so, and cats technically domesticated themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they were the ones who started living around us. Dogs we kind of brought in. Yeah, we'd be come <laughs> to the campfire and we would. Hurt. Can't make a cat do anything. No. Oh. No. No. Everyone to feel small they in this world. Get they a cat. Mice. And so we'd leave food out for them and stuff like that. So. Uh, and then the horse, which is was the major mode of transportation until modern age. On the issue of horses, 
one of my favorite mystery series of all times and one of my favorite mystery writers is the late great Dick Francis yeah. who wrote about horse racing and all of his his, his books almost always are, are standalones. He doesn't have series characters very much that take the lead, but it's all about the wonderful world of horse racing and everything that that means to people. So he has to say not very much about the entire world because he can get straight to the plot, plot and make it go really fast and zip through because his world is so well known and so inspiring and so much fun for people they already love it this is tangential to the um to the topic of animals and stories but it is a way that we use people's associations with animals and stories so um if you on the subject of older cartoons cobra command cobra command is an evil organization and you know they must be dangerous because cobra is the first thing you think of, or like the venom and the danger of these snakes. Also, um, the addiction to the snake motif helps. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, snake shaped um, cars, snake shaped planes, snake shaped guns, snake shaped people. Snake <laughs> and snakes are also kind of a, an animal that you don't feel that you can reason with, or like in a way that you could with, say, a dog. Not like, to mention them being adopted as the guys of Satan in one of the earliest stories ever made. This is true, too. <laughs> so there are all sorts of associations that we have with animals that we can bring up subconsciously in the reader. Um, if you've ever heard of Marvel, the comics, uh, in the comics business, and perhaps seen any of their films with S.H.I.E.L.D. in it, mm-hmm. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s emblem is an eagle. What does that bring to mind, Americans? Yes. So you know just through association of the animal that they're using, what they're representing and something about them. Um, However, it was America that changed the opinion of the eagle. The eagle was thought to be not the nicest of birds uh, until America adopted as its as its emblem, and others as well. well no, no, Ancient no. Rome used yeah. eagle. No, mm-hmm. I know, but the point, yeah, but part of the reason they did it was because of their fierceness, their fierceness. and the way that they attacked. That flipped with America. It's one of the reasons yeah. why Benjamin Franklin hated the idea of having the eagle as our symbol. He right, he wanted a turkey. He wanted us to be the turkey. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that makes Thanksgiving so much darker. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons why he wanted it to be the turkey is because it was the sustenance of our original settlers. But the greatness of the eagle is is kind of an American Cannibal adoption. Americans every holiday. Beforehand, it was very much about. The fact that it would strike fiercely and kill quickly and, mm-hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. It was a bird of war. Right? The other yeah. interesting thing was the eagle was made our national bird before we knew there were eagles in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, can I take us on another tangent? Sure. sure. All right. Shapeshifters, guys. Oh, okay. Because, yeah. Fedora, you brought up Little Red Riding Hood and um, Wolf Men were a way of warning girls off of dangerous men who were like wolves and that they would devour your, you know, your virginity and your virtue and everything that was good and innocent about you. Sometimes your whole body. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Along with that, I'll let you continue, but along with that, in modern uh, culture, especially with soldiers, law enforcement, and us type, those type people, you've got a phrase. You've You've got three kinds of people out there. The sheep, which is usually your normal citizen, the wolf, and the sheepdog. The predator, the defender, and the, and the and people. The prey. Right. Yep. One of the things that I what? like about a good shifter story, a good shapeshifter story, where a person becomes an animal of some kind, is when they bring in uh, qualities of the animal to the human's method of thought. So a dog thinks of humans in a certain way. Like, they think we're great. Mm-hmm. You're, a dog's human is the best ever. And they bring some of the, like the kind of pack mentality of, oh, that person's the best ever into their human lives. So the animal nature interferes with the human nature and vice versa, which I think can be great. Well, and two, that's coming off of a long tradition of, you know, werewolf, you know, stories and stuff like that that was very prevalent throughout Europe and, you know, other places. Mm-hmm. Um, that shape-shifting ideal. I want to shift to a slightly different topic. Talk it. Ignore, ignore the pun there. I was going to say good transition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ignoring that pun. I'm praising that pun. Mm-hmm. Yes, Melody. That was yes. good. But um, yes, Twain. Kitty Twain is here to uh, bring up my point, and uh, 
when you're writing a story that isn't primarily about animals, sometimes it's useful to have uh, animals in the book to break up a scene. Hmm. Namely, if you have conversations between characters, it's rather boring if they're just sitting on the plot couch yes. discussing things. The exposition couch. The exposition <laughs> couch, but uh, if they are doing something like, you know, chasing a cat or doing something else, you know. Or if a cat disrupts a, a scene or maybe jumps on someone's head when they're having a romantic moment or whatever. You, know? you I was mentioning Rodan earlier, the dragon in my book. Yeah. That's one of my major reasons for using him. Mm -hmm. Is to break up scenes between my you know, main female and main male character who are constantly throughout the book. It would just be the two of them having weird conversations <laughs> all the time. By having this dragon there that they both love, adore, and you know, coddle all the time, uh, it, it adds that other element in that makes the scene interesting. I was going to say, animals can also be used to, to aid the plot, um, yeah. which they do in Terminator films. Mm -hmm. um, dogs bark at Terminators. Yeah. They don't like them. And where people couldn't tell whether the person coming in was a Terminator in disguise or not, the dogs would be like, that dude is weird, we don't like him, we are backing away. Looks like people, does not smell like people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and going back to what I mentioned earlier, Cat Who, the Cat Who series, the cat was a way to move the plot along, and a way to break up the plot. I think, too, you're, you're mentioning the Terminator aspect. <laughs> it kind of goes to the notion of how we look at cats and dogs and stuff as having powers, Fedora mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. um, you know, we almost put super superpowers upon them. I mean, you know, and, and it's it's proven true as we scientifically test them out now and everything. You know, dogs have the ability to sniff cancer. Mm -hmm. um, you now have your support dogs who can sense the slightest anxiety rising in you and they'll come up and put their head on you and, you know, that eases your own in, inner anxiety. You know, so we we put this stuff on the end was probably because our forefathers knew all of this stuff to be true. <laughs> we put it into stories as lore, and now we're proving it once again through science. Some cats can do things like that, too. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, but only when they want to. I know. Sure. I just I just felt bad for not bringing it up, even though I totally love dogs more. Lots guys. of animals can be used to support animals. I, I wrote a story about a support pony. <gasps> And the the child uh, in was question. The child's pony? Yes, the child in question was allergic to dogs, so he had a seeing eye pony to help him walk around. Cool. That is the cutest Christmas present from mommy and daddy ever. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I think that is a very good point that animals have powers that we don't understand, like being able to hear. The dogs uh, can hear mm -hmm. sounds which are at a way higher pitch than anything we can hear. By the same token, though. We project our own feelings upon them, which we have no idea of whether that is true, and very probably it is not. That even has a name, it's called the pathetic fallacy. So we should be aware of that and know exactly what we're doing when, when we uh, describe the inner workings of a cat's mind or a dog's mind or it, moment, when it uh, uh, tries to destroy the television set. <laughs> yes. yes, right now Mark is playing with the recording set. Mark the cat likes the moving uh, audio bar. He likes to see he the shapes grab move. It. Yep. He wanted to grab you Mark, it. Mark the cat. Yes. Um, well, Twain just wants petty. Mark Season and Twain. One. The, yes, the, the right pack has got now three Podcast Pumpkin, who has been in the podcast, he's kind of hiding. We've got Mark and Twain. Yep. And I, I miss and Pumpkin because he doesn't get my hair anymore. Yeah. That I mean, literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So, what was I going to say? <laughs> you I don't know. I love see, it. the cats broke up the scene. <laughs> exactly. That's true. And added in an element of humor. Yes. You know, speaking of, of cats and dogs and TVs, TVs nowadays have enough pixel depth that uh, cats and dogs can actually see it as accurate to real life. And bark at them. And bark at them watching and understand what's going on. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Yes. Thank you, Jen. Caesar Milan will say, you know, your pets are picking up on your emotions. They, they didn't dislike the mailman, like, who came to your door. You didn't trust him, and they picked up on that and barked at him. Um, but... Um, or that is something. Up the mailman's anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is that is something to keep in mind when we're writing animals. But um, one of the the cool things about pets, um, especially dogs, in cases like this, are 
do- women um, learn early in American culture not to trust their instincts because it's not convenient to other people. And um, one thing that animals can do for women, um, dogs in particular, is allow them not to trust people that come to their door or come to their house. It, it, it lends an air of legitimacy to things that people might have just ignored on their own. Like, I'm not sure I trust this, this guy who came in who says he's going to do this and this and this to fix my toilet. I, I'm sure he's fine. But then the dog barks at him and you're like, I knew it. Well, I get, you know, the dog doesn't like him. I, maybe something is wrong. And then you find out later he, like, robbed somebody's house. Well, and then the women were, have been trained. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've been, oh, we've yeah. been very well trained. You haven't taken enough women's studies courses in college. <laughs> no, I didn't. I did not. It was the stories your mother didn't tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could read Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes, in You're which she, um... Me, right? Huh? Text that to me later, right? Oh, we ADD promise. Um, <laughs> so um, she she uses wolves in ex, as an example of women trying to get back in touch with their wilder nature, their more instinctive wilder nature. Mm. Go yes. Are you done? I can no. be. No, just another use of animals. Yes, it is another use of well, animals. That's what she also uses fairy tales to go into that. Which, uh, yeah, a good another use of animals in stories uh, is not only to bring a nature element into it, but to bring a. Uh, an instinct and uh, and more like carnal element to your story. And if you have uh, your character getting lost in the woods and chased by wolves, it's emphasizing how dangerous being in the woods is. True. If you have the wolves invade the the party, you know the the kings. Let's say the king's having a party and a pack of wolves invade. Uh, you can use that as a statement about how the outside world is invading the civilized culture and uh, how dangerous the outside world is. Like those, the, dolphins and sharks. Yeah, the there's a reason we're always afraid. You know, it's like we've got all these shark movies that always come out. Uh, it's to let you know what's the tagline for Jaws. It's not safe to go in the water. Yeah. <laughs> However, when we have the myth, mythos, which is tr- proven true in several instances, of the dolphins saving the humans from the sharks, whale, mm-hmm. you know, killer whales, whatever. And, and sharks aren't nearly as dangerous in real life as they are in the movies. Correct. I gotta gotta put a blanket on there. Everyone yes. who's afraid of getting in the ocean. I know. You're more. You probably have a better chance of dying on your way to the ocean than in the ocean. That goes Steve Irwin did so much for me in sharks and crocodiles and snakes. Oh, poor Steve Irwin. Jin's a, uh, a go on. Oh, uh, Steve Irwin's a real life example, which is too bad because you could use his story. You could tell his story in a certain way that he loved all of these vicious wild animals he understood them he researched them and he he didn't tame them but he knew how to behave around them Mm -hmm. and then he was taken out by something he considered peaceful that would never hurt a fly the stingray killed him uh stingray was just being a stingray but he let his guard down on it because he didn't think that it was dangerous to him which it shouldn't have been. It was kind of a horrible fluke. Yeah. This is one of the cases. I, I believe in God. I believe God took him the only way he could, which was by surprise. Yeah. <laughs> it was far too perfect for him to, to be in here with the stingrays and have a stingray barb go straight into his heart. Like, straight in. And the yeah. only reason he died then was because his reflex was to pull it out. If he'd left the, the stingray barb in his heart in time to get him to the hospital, they could have they saved him. I had no idea that was yeah, the Yeah, he case. bled out oh, through the yeah. hole. It's oh. Horrible. So that's, that's tragic. So so Sorry, Steve. To your I love earlier, you. To your earlier points that you were making, I was going to bring it back to using animals to describe, like using animalistic descriptions to describe mm-hmm. things and stories. Like um, lawyers are equated with sharks in, in oh, you know. Yeah. Um, and people who, who act like puppies are really innocent and excitable people who are just going to see the best in everybody. Um, and often in, in films and in books, when they kill an animal and it's a dog, it's because the animal was good. And it's a sign that bad things happen in this world and mm-hmm. a stuff is about to get serious. Like in I Am Legend, uh, the dog, the film, not the books. Yeah, the um, book and the film are very different. Yes. Um, Will Smith has to kill his dog spoiler alert because his dog is becoming a zombie and that's the moment when my heart broke because the dog was all he had left in this world that was good and wholesome and a companion Mm -hmm. um joss whedon does a similar things thing he's like 
um, I, I show the viewers a puppy, I make them love the puppy, and then I kill their puppy. I'm paraphrasing, it's horrible. Um, but he doesn't do that with like animals or only animals. He does that with human puppies, the human version of a puppy. He'll take a character that is good and innocent and sees the best in everybody and he'll kill them so that you know bad things happen in the world and your heart is broken. Um, and, and I'm realizing there's a story that I'm writing with a friend and we, we had a character that was basically a puppy character. And I, I said, oh no, if one of them dies, it has to be this one. Oh, because it's always that kind of character that It's dies. always the puppy that dies. Yeah, you, you always kill the puppy, whether they're human or puppy. But didn't we just say that you shouldn't kill the puppy because it's cheating? Yes. So there are different, there are different. You, different, Martin, you don't. We should just kill everyone but the puppy. <laughs> So you, <laughs> you don't kill the puppy to show that someone is evil because that's cliche. Mm -hmm. And you probably shouldn't only kill the puppy if you're killing one character um, in a group. But because it is the puppy type character, that's what will break people yes. up the most. Because you're killing the heart of a group of people. Mm -hmm. And quick one, George, please stop killing dire wolves. It's killing me. Sorry. You're a dire wolf and it's killing you. Yes. Well, no, 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 like, he's killed too many of the dire wolves. That bugged me. Yeah. So much bugged me. So much bugged me. But that is, this, that is a person who is using animals and people with animalistic qualities, like utter savagery like sharks, yes. Lannisters, um, <laughs> to uh, subvert tropes. Mm -hmm. Well, you're mentioning, so one of the things Disney does all the time is take that... Uh, anamorphizing humans into giving them uh, animal ca characteristics. Lawyers as sharks. Uh, you know, Baloo the bear is always kind of that big oafish guy. Whether he's in the Jungle Book or whether he's, you know, the same mm -hmm. character, but, you know. In Robin Hood. In Robin Hood or even in uh, Tailspin. You know, so, uh, you know, by doing that, it, it's a way of kind of sh using those characteristics to kind of in, like I guess imparts those characteristics to you, the viewer, without necessarily having to show them all. You know, we know if it's a bear, they're going to be kind of big. It might be oafish. They're going to be giant and cuddly. Unless they have their eyes whited out, and then they're going to eat you. There you go. Zootopia does that very yeah, well, yeah, too. Yeah, Zootopia was huge for this. How about the issue of animals as gods, or... Of, care, of creatures which are part animal, part human, like satyrs yes. uh, or centaurs, uh, centaurs exactly, or uh, mermaids, the Egyptian pantheon. Yeah, they Sorry, all Egyptian of them. Pantheon, yeah. How does do you think all of this fits together? That is, why would anyone want to incorporate as a god, person and animal? Uh, I think. It goes back to the characteristics we associate with animals. Um, I have learned recently that it's not very good for non-native American people to use the term spirit animals to suggest that they have a connection with animals because it's kind of sacrilegious. So, um, but there are certainly animals that we see as having certain qualities, like wolves we see as like capable of being brutal and, but like they're loyal, they hunt in packs. So, um, and family, -oriented. Mm -hmm, and family oriented. So we see good and bad qualities. We associate them with these animals. I think with the, um, the gods aspect, we, well, they were maybe capitalizing on certain traits that they well, like associate Pan, with the animals. For example, a goat man. Mm -hmm. What to, is your take on Pan? And can I go with satyrs? That's, really? Yeah. Cause That's satyrs in general, like goats and satyrs really, really, really horny. Like yeah. extremely sexual beings. But kind we don't of think of goats as being any sexier than any other. Well, not like sexier, the devil but they are, they not are sexy. Very, uh, Voraciously male sexual. rams. Let's just say you don't need many to keep all the female. <laughs> they're to, uh, they're like lifelong rut, basically. Yeah. Like that's the the association that I think but, the Greeks and, and Romans yet, had. There's with not a rabbit man. If you wanted to be sexy, you'd think but rabbit. But you can boink like bunnies. Six. 
six litters a year, I think. That's we have a term for that that I'm using the most benign version of boinking like bunnies. <laughs> but there's not a rabbit man or a rabbit woman. That's because rabbits aren't. Uh, they're prey they animals. They don't have any strength. Mm-hmm. They're prey animals. Yeah, they're kept in cages. The other thing is horns. rams have a larger. Let's just say rams are male. Rams are more impressive than rabbits are, uh, and they have impressive well, horns let's, let's go with of Egyptian many varieties. <laughs> go ahead. Let's go with the Egyptian mythology because you guys have just said it, uh, and this is also true with Marvel and D- I'm trying to think of DC comic ones, but definitely Marvel, <laughs> which use animals to combine with man. Okay, uh, let's set or Seth. We don't know what the heck that animal is. So it's connected to him. It never, we have it existed. It's long extinct. We don't know. But Osiris, or rather, I'm sorry, wrong one, Anubis. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah Anubis. I mean, Osiris Anubis. is just a dude. Osiris, <laughs> Osiris is a dude. Anubis. What is it? What it's is it? It's a jackal. Jackal. It's a jackal. It's a jackal. Yeah. Horus. Uh, a hawk. A hawk. Um, but that's because Horus was a sky god. He was, you know, he was a sky god. Yeah. But and that's, that's it. Why and yeah. then my mind just went blank with the, um... You have Bastet, who's the cat. Right, yeah. Bastet, uh, the cat. You have, uh... Yeah. <coughs> uh the one that's a Set, crocodile. Which is a cat. Oh, um... Yeah, my mind just went blank. Starts with an S. Yeah. Um, sco- uh... Ah! I'm, I'm, uh, I'd help you if I could sing the, uh... Audience, please Google that for us. Yes. Thank you. Anyway, I, I, I'll look it up. And then Prince of Egypt is where you're going with that. Yes. Awesome movie. Great. Yeah, and, and they, they sing all the names of the gods. Yes. And there's also the goddess who got transformed into basically a hungry hippopotamus eating everything. Now notice what we're talking about. Horus, the, we have falcons. They're predators. Jackals, predators. Crocodiles, predators. Yeah, the, but Anubis was also a guardian. It was a guardian. You can be a guardian and a guardian. No, but that's, well, that's, that's, why is, is, that's why he's the jackal, because they well, used to use is, jackals to guard the temples. And the hippopotamus, which is also dangerous to mankind. Snap a lion in half. They kill more <laughs> more people than crocodiles every right. year. What we're talking about is pe- mankind, our ancient ancestors, and through them yeah. to us, see the animals that are predators or able to defend themselves against the predators as being more powerful than prey animals. And that's why we don't see Bunny Man. Why we don't see, um, yes, we've seen the fly as far as, as a science fiction. We don't see Fly Man. We Turning into a fly was considered a horror it in was. that movie. Like, yes, he, he wasn't gifted powers because he was becoming a fly. Gregor right. Samsa became a giant cockroach. It wasn't a good thing. Right. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about is that whole entire metamorphosis, um, in w- in which. You're using it in mythology, and you're using it in comic books and other stories. But yes, we don't yes. have Mouse Man. We don't have Mouse Man. And we don't have, you know... Because we, we Mighty admire... Mouse. Mighty the, Mouse is, uh, is supposed to be funny for its juxtaposition. Yes. Right. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, we look at that, and we admire as a race of beings the strength that we see in animals. Yes. Centaurs, which, going back to your Greek mythology, centaurs were considered to be barbaric people. They would raid and steal. And yes, there was a centaur who did, who trained some of the famous heroes as well. And I'm leaving that part alone. I was looking at the mythology in general. Now, I'm not talking about Harry Potter either. Um, Harry Potter, they were in, they were only there was like one that was nice, and the rest were pissed off. Right. But what I'm saying is, look, that what is the element of a horse? What can a horse do? A horse is swift as heck to get in and out, and horses don't don't. Most you pen them in, don't care where they're at. They <laughs> will eat across everything. And we use the horses for raiding purposes. Uh, there are various animals which are combined. And uh, one of my favorites is the Kairin, which is out of Japan. It is actually more powerful than a dragon. What is it? A Kairin is basically a Japanese unicorn, but it is ugly as hell. It is the ugliest creature you'll see. In fact, if you saw. Uh, I, I, forgive yourself if you did see the 47 Runyon with um, Keanu Reeves. They kill one in it. It has multiple eyes. It has the head of a dragon. has horns, kind of like an antelope. has a body of a lion. 
It's basically a multi amp. So multi it's a chimera type thing? It's basically like, like chimera. But it actually is more powerful than a dragon. And in the mythology, it would go after evil creatures only, evil people only. If you saw it and you were not evil, it was good, it was good fortune. It would go out of its way not to step, even step on grass to hurt grass. But if you were evil, you were getting horns, you were getting fire, you were getting thunder at you. Go ahead. Sorry, that made me think of unicorns and our uh, mythology around unicorns. They're, they're pure and mm -hmm. kind of, they're attracted to the pure, the virginal, and they'll, they'll lay their horns in a nice virginal <laughs> woman's lap, which is not at all saucy or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but because those are what we associate with unicorns, uh, uh, TV shows like Gravity Falls are able to play with our assumptions of unicorns um, by making uniform unicorns utterly snooty, they don't actually have special powers. They're just stuck up. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very beautiful. And you think they're nice and pure, but then they're just horrible. They're horrible people, really. And uh, I, there's a story by Megan, Megan Durr about, um, I think it's Wiggles and Sparkles uh, by Less, at Less Than Three Press. But um, it's about paranormal investigators who are also paranormal beings so one of them is a kraken shifter and one of them is a unicorn shifter and the unicorn shifter is ostracized by other unicorns because he likes having sex and that's just completely completely against their whole image so he's an outcast because he's you know a dude in the modern society <laughs> who likes having sex with people and is thus impure and not living up to his unicorn standards that everyone else has set we should probably also mention, too, that a lot of these animals are interpretations or misinterpretations or mm -hmm. however you want to look at it of the world around them that they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. The unicorn being a great example of that. There are, and non-existent. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, but that. narwhal horns for centuries were used as unicorn horns. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a famous sword that has a unicorn handle. Uh, unicorn horn handle was thought to have been legendary and magic and all that kind of stuff. It's a narwhal handle, um, you know. So Chinese, uh, going with them, yeah. they thought to be actually they were probably giraffes. Yes, it yeah. was the same. Um, and, you know, and going from that, you have uh, like you know some of the first lions that the Europeans saw, some of the first crocodiles that they saw, stuff like that were thought to be these legendary monsters. The kraken of uh, mm -hmm. the deep is really probably just a Giant very squid, large giant squid. squid, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, partly it was a misinterpretation of the, the scary world around them. Dragons are sometimes thought to have been thunder and lightning, mm -hmm. you know. That is one thing that makes me kind of sad that we live in a world where we don't think those things exist anymore. To yeah. be like, fair, on the one they hand, thought the giant squid was mythical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, I'm like, yay, I probably won't get, you know, eaten by a dragon or sacrificed on a stone to a dragon that may or may not show up or to a sea monster. Life is great. Dragons were also probably dinosaurs. But on the other hand, I, I now, I don't believe that somewhere Star-Lord from the Marvel series actually has a team of trained velociraptors. And that <laughs> breaks my heart because some things are just too wonderful not to believe in. Hey, you never know what's coming. We're, we're bringing back the Mastodon. That's uh, a great plan, you know. humans. Have you not seen Jurassic Park? <laughs> yeah, <it's so laughs> cool. in God's domain. Uh, they just uh, see fully sequenced the T Rex. Um, <laughs> yes, that was obviously their priority. <laughs> so you know, like you know, we don't know what the future is going to hold there. So you know. But this brings us to another use of animals in fiction: animals as monsters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Godzilla. Cujo. Yes. One of the Cujo. reasons Cujo, Cujo is probably Cujo. so terrifying is that dogs are innocent and happy and blah blah. We've already mm -hmm. talked about this, but this is when they're rabid. Exactly. Rabid dogs are terrifying. Old Yeller. And on a side note of that, remember, Stephen King didn't remember writing the darn book. Yeah. Well, I would That's feel horrified too. That's because it came too. straight from hell through him. <laughs> right. Cujo. Because I just rolled back in his head, anyways. Cujo, and then he was back. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't want to remember writing a horrible, murderous dog either. I'd feel so, so just like I had betrayed my own dogs. And real life is just as scary. So uh, to throw it out there, one of my favorite animals through all of history is Bucephalus, who is Alexander the Great's horse. Alexander the Great's horse is known through stories 
to be able to bite a man's head off. <laughs> and that this was trained, and this is something he actually did in battle. That he would just boop, grab, and rip off. Yikes. I don't know if it's true or not. I can't say that it's true or not. But, you know, Bucephalus is known, too, to have saved Alexander the Great's life on, in several battles. So we don't know, but it's, you know, it's been passed down. It's legendary. He had cities named after him. You know, all this kind of fun stuff. But uh, Bucephalus has this such a legend that thousands of years later... We not only still know his name, we still know the stories about him, but he's one of the most legendary horses of history. Uh, I was going to, I mentioned tremors earlier because we were like, oh yeah, all animals agree. Because that was where we were in the conversation and yeah. I was like, tremors. Um, something that we do is we make up animals. Um, <coughs> and one of the great things about having an animal as a monster in a story is that you know already that they don't think like humans do. They can't reason the way humans do. So unlike if you have a human killer, you can't tell this animal, please stop killing me. I am a nice person. I give money to the poor. And also I will give money to you if you spare my life. Animal don't care. It's like a honey badger. It's going to murder you anyway if honey badgers were murderous animals. Well, for people able are, to kill people and, overeat. Mm -hmm. and that's that's one reason why like reptile villains are terrifying mm -hmm. because some part of them you have the connotation of them being inhuman and yes. seeing like n not mammalian so they're cold-blooded yeah. and mm -hmm. that has its own connotations mm -hmm. i just have a final word well, if you've never read watership down by douglas no. Adams, <laughs> you want to read a good oh, animal what? book read that wasn't it Douglas Adams? No, no, yeah, right. Adams. no it doesn't okay, sound I'm like sorry. his books at all. No. The Worship Down is a great book, and it is one that you should read. I don't know why that came out of my mouth. That's, that's, okay. what, I, that's what I thought. You were I thinking about Vicious Rabbits. That's <laughs> what that's about. Yeah, Douglas Adams wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, they, and some other yeah. stuff like that. So. There is a Vorpal Bunny used for um, amusement and also murder in the Monty Python and the I Holy Grail. I was just film. thinking of that. <sighs> awesome. Because say, it's a prey animal. Day. Bunnies aren't dangerous at all. Like Zootopia, <laughs> Zootopia, half the thing is that she's a bunny. She's not a, a predator animal. What can she possibly do on a police force? And that's why there were Playboy bunnies, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's going back. Yeah, to yeah, the not, that. not on that, that note. Yeah. Yeah. Not on that note. I do want to mention one more animal group back before Rocket, we so. go. I would feel. It would be remiss of me not to bring up the companions from Mercedes Lackey's Valdemar uh, fantasy series. They're basically uh, the rich guy comes to your house and takes you away from all of your troubles and lets you live happily ever after with him doing awesome things, except they're horses. Hmm. So they're white horses. So somebody, somebody totally brought up white knighting. Uh, that concept is the Valdemar horses. Yes. But basically... Horses in Valdemar are as smart as humans, if not a little bit more. They're spiritual beings, and they're in service of the kingdom. They help protect the kingdom. And every horse has a soulmate, I mean a human companion, that they will go and find, usually in a horrible situation, and bring them out of that situation into a better life. So um, animals can also rescue people and bring them into a better world and help them realize their full potential while being a soulmate that is completely not bestiality because they're only friends. <laughs> they're platonic soulmates. Oh, except for one book. <laughs> on that note, thank you for tuning in to Write Back Radio. Tune in next week for yet another interesting tale of the writing industry. Have a great week writing. And they yeah, they, they both there. died. It was heartbreaking. They had to be in love. Otherwise, when they both die horribly in the fire, you don't feel as much pain for them. But they never would have had kids anyway. Gateway Con? What is Gateway Con? The Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, brought to you by St. Louis Writers Guild, is a new, unique experience for writers looking for their work to be either traditionally published, independently published, self-published, or to further their writing career. Coming in June 2017, Gateway Con will provide opportunities for writers to pitch their work to agents, hone their craft regardless if it is genre fiction or nonfiction, and obtain expert critiques. Get to meet vendors and experts who can help your writing get attention, and all writers get their work in front of their audience. Writers 
Publishers will get to network with agents, publishers, and others in your genre. Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention will be in St. Louis June 16th through the 18th, 2017. For more information, visit www.stlwritersguild.org or look for GatewayCon on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. GatewayCon, opening the gateway for writers to reach their readers. Did you know that Right Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.